Gelkin joins the show to talk about Terrence Steele, the 2023 Cowboys, and much more. Here we go. What is up, everyone, and welcome into ADZ Sports Dallas Primetime. I am your host, Mauricio Rodriguez, streaming with you live every Sunday through Thursday night at 8 p.m. Central here on Dallas On Demand Sports Talk Network with a lot more content coming your way. Make sure you check out the website, adcsports.com slash Dallas. I don't want to wait a single second more to introduce today uh, our guest, and it's a really, really special guest. It is Michael Gelkin. And before I say hi, let me say this. Roster cut down day, I got to give it to Michael he was dominating like Patrick Mahomes does on a Sunday because, man, every report, it seemed like Michael Gelkin was the first one to it. So, Michael, welcome into the show. I'm stoked about having you on it. And uh, how are you? Thank you for having me, Manishio. I'm doing, I'm doing pretty well. Uh, it's it's nice, to, nice to connect. Thanks for the invite. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, tonight, uh, we actually had uh, talked about you joining the show since yesterday. And then this morning... Big Cowboys news drops. Terrence Steele gets a new deal, five-year extension for almost $87 million with a maximum value of $91 million. My first question for me to you is this. Seems like everyone around the Cowboys Twitter space was like, heck yeah, Terrence Steele deserves it because he's a hard worker. That term came up in pretty much everyone's mind. Like Terrence deserved it. What's your perspective from the deal and, you know, specifically in how the Cowboys look at Terrence Steele with all of the work that he's done since he joined the Cowboys as an undrafted free agent? Well, I'm glad to hear that Cowboys fans kind of get the picture as it pertains to Terrence Steele, because I remember in training camp last year, I was in Oxnard and Zach Martin talked about how the run game really starts with Terrence Steele. And at the time, that was something that caught people off guard, caught even me to some level off guard. I mean, I knew the Cowboys thought highly of Terrence Steele, but to hear Zach Martin speak about him in those terms, it really you know, clicked in my mind that I needed to do a better job of making sure that the way the organization viewed Terrence Steele was a little bit more public. And so I remember writing a story in October that focused on the duo concept, which was it's a run play, it's similar to inside zone. And really, it's predicated on combination blocks. You can get uh, two or even up to three combination blocks in that play. And when you have Zach Martin and Terrence Steele double teaming a guy at the first level, and then one of those two, uh, let's say Terrence runs off to the second, it just, you know, you, you, it was, it's kind of a foundation bread and butter uh, for the Cowboys run game. So to see now a guy who has a, a torn ACL, a torn MCL, a torn, torn MPFL. Uh, last December, uh, come back to be ready for week one and to win for the third straight offseason. He's been with the Cowboys. You know, he's had three offseasons with the team. Each of those offseasons, he won a strength and conditioning offseason award. Um, yeah, it just He's a guy who I would feel very comfortable if I was a front office. And you never know how these deals are going to age, but I would feel very comfortable. If I'm going to lose out on a guy, let me lose betting on a guy like Terrence Steele to give me everything that he's got to continue developing uh, you know, he's just a guy who enjoys the process of getting better. And that is, is a bit of a rare thing in the NFL where a guy just truly, truly wants to be his best self and enjoys every day getting up and putting in the, you know, the hours of training and, and prehab and everything that it entails. That's Terrence Steele. And it makes and we got to see a little bit of that, you know, evidence of his, his impact in the running game when he went down. Right. Pretty much every rushing yeah. metric for the Cowboys went down with him once he was off the field and once the Cowboys had to figure out that part of it. And then it seems to me that we are at a point which Terrence Steele is universally seen as this great run blocker. But then even in pass pro, he doesn't get enough of the credit sometimes because he's out there being explosive out of his stance. He's out there allowing less pressures than average. So I think that's also a testament to his work. And then you think back of that rookie season, and it might be one of the biggest bets or first big bets that Mike McCarthy made when he was uh, in town for the first year, like, you know, trusting Terrence Steele, throwing him into the fire. And then we saw a very rough version of Terrence Steele in that rookie year and just the improvement 
that he's shown from there has been amazing to see. I'll ask this too, like, because uh, it goes hand in hand with his improvement. A lot of it has to do with the Cowboys coaching staff, but we also know that there's like a third party outside of the team, and that's Big Duke. That's Duke Manyweather, who's done a tremendous job developing offensive linemen pretty much across the entire NFL. But it seems like he has a focus with Cowboys players, or maybe I'm biased because I look at it from the Cowboys point of view, because we know that he works with pretty much feels like every Cowboy, right? So I, I guess my question would be, is there any sort of like close relationship between franchise and Duke? Or is it more of a, the players do it by themselves because maybe they get to Dallas and the other players get them to go with Duke? I think it's kind of funny because from, from a proximity standpoint, it's about as close a relationship as you can get between Duke Manyweather and the Cowboys because he's literally across the street from them. Like there's the team facility and the Ford Center right there connected. And then there's a hotel and then there's where Duke's gym is or where he, he, he's based with all his workouts with his guys where he hosts OL Masterminds every July. So uh, from that standpoint, you know, he's right there. Uh, but I think it's really more player driven. And you're right. He does work out with a number of Cowboys players. There probably is a bit of a, you know, a local aspect of that where he's just, it's just so convenient, but also he's just really, really good. And that's, you know, he's, that's reflected in people all around the NFL will come to hear what Duke Manyweather has to say about their game or about offensive line trends in general. He's just that respected across the NFL. So I enjoy every chance I get to talk about Duke uh, because I've now at myself having been my fourth, my part, my fifth season covering the, the Cowboys. I've had a number of interactions with Duke and each one of those uh, leaves me thinking about how fortunate Cowboys players are to have many weather in their backyard. And obviously with Zach Martin, he had a holdout, uh, you know, because of the contract situation and while he was waiting for that whole thing to get fleshed out, he had a decision on how he was going to spend his time in Dallas while the team was in Oxnard. No surprise, he chose to train with Duke Manyweather. And I, I love to hear that. I love to hear that it's player driven because I know the one story like, uh, you know, I've, I've bugged you multiple times with questions about my guy, Big Isaac, Isaac Alarcon. I'm Mexican. Mm -hmm. I am born and raised. I live here. I, I love the guy. I've had multiple interviews with him. And he once told me a story of, how Lyle Collins, when Isaac got to Dallas, Lyle Collins was like, hey, come work out with Duke and I'll pay for your session. So he paid for multiple sessions for him. And it really, in my opinion, like drives home the point of how much they love working out with Duke and how big he has uh, made an impact in, in Dallas. I'll ask this now, turning it a little bit into the deal for Terrence Steele. Feels like the Cowboys have been spending a lot this year, and it's exactly what we want to see, right? We want to see them keep Trayvon Diggs. We want to see them uh, keep uh, Terrence Steele. Do you see any sort of like difference in their mindset getting ahead of some of these deals, even though we're still waiting for the Dak Prescott contract extension and the CeeDee Lamp extension, and we don't know how long we'll have to wait once Micah Parsons is eligible in 2024? Do you, do you see a different mindset there, or is it just maybe the fact that they have a lot of deals to do. I think this is what the Cowboys ideally want, where they're getting ahead of market. So Trayvon Diggs was scheduled to become an unrestricted free agent in March of 2024. If you wait and you know, have him play the entire 2023 season, unless he really falls off or has some major type of injury and, you know, things can happen in this league, but uh, otherwise, you're, you're, if you wanted to, if you want to pay Trayvon Diggs, you want to have him to be part of your football team long term. You're better doing it now rather than later. Because if you wait, the salary cap is going to go up, and there's also going to be 31 other teams potentially vying for that player's services. So you're able to just have an exclusive little window here before the start of the season. There's a lot of incentive for a team to get it done, and likewise for a player. You know, you look back at the 2019 uh, summer. The Cowboys got Jalen Smith done to get ahead of him. They got Lyle Collins done to get rid of, ahead of him. And that's because the 30-day holdout, they got Ezekiel Elliott done. Now, none of those three contracts aged well for the team. All of those aged well for the player, which, again, if you're a player, and you have the opportunity to get paid. There's something to be said for striking while the iron is, is hot. Uh, now, the Cowboys hope, of course, that this summer goes a lot better than the 2019 summer. And so it's Trayvon Diggs. It's Malik Hooker, and now it's Terrence Steele. All those guys are locked in and no longer, again, are coming for agents in next March. So 
it's it's there's some there's some risk to this thing, but the, the Cowboys, you know, believe that they're they're doing what they need to do to take care of their offensive line long term to keep this defense humming with Malik Hooker. Um, it, you know, it, it just you kind of just go down the line, but they, they they really believe that this is what it takes to be a, a draft and develop organization. Is is you, it's, it's one thing to, to draft talent. Uh, with you know, a bit ironic they didn't draft Malik Hooker. You know, they didn't draft Terrence Steele, who was an undrafted free agent signing, but nonetheless, uh, essentially the same. Um, but you you want to sign these guys and keep them into your building. It's, it's a critical part of their philosophy. So by doing that with with these three guys, with, with Diggs, of course, a draft pick, that's that's a big part of uh, their the, what they've all, what they've always believed, and now they have an opportunity to put it into application. Now I know you know Cowboys fans, and you know that paranoia that can creep into their minds sometimes. And I'm guessing your notifications are lit up every time news like this happens. Because I, you know, you celebrate the deal, right? For Trent Seal, Cowboys fans are like glad he got paid and everything. But immediately, one second later, their minds turn to, oh, heck, how, now how are they going to pay uh, Michael Parsons? And how they, are they going to pay uh, Dak Prescott and CeeDee Lamb? Are they going to play hardball with them? Are they going to... Uh, maybe lowball them a little bit and have another, I don't want to say, I don't want to get necessarily into all of it, but like the Amari Cooper situation where Cowboys fans were super upset. And I, I'm going to include myself there because I really was upset that they let Amari Cooper go. Do you expect or from one to 10, how confident would you be in the Cowboys getting those big three players locked in in the future or, you know, Dak, CD, and Micah. Like, how confident would you be that they get it, that they get them all done? Well, so one, just to address Amari Cooper, he's no longer a Dallas Cowboy, not because they fumbled their books, uh, because they paid other people per se. It's more of the, you know, they're just not that into you type of yeah. thing, where if, if that was CD Lamb, they're not trading him away for a day three draft pick. Let's yeah. acknowledge that. So um, set that aside. There's the Cowboys did not just pay Terrence Steele with believing that 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 could jeopardize a Dak Prescott deal or a Micah Parsons deal or a CD Lamb deal. Like there's no world where, and I get front offices aren't perfect. Every front office makes mistake. I've covered other teams before. It happens. Everyone's got deals that they want back, but there these guys aren't about to pay their right tackle. You know, Terrence Steele, you know, a top 10 right tackle, you know, a top me top five, you know, emerging guy. We, like, we love Terrence Steele pieces. We can talk about all night, but set that aside. They're not about to pay him and then jeopardize any of those three guys. So the Cowboys feel very confident in the way they structure the contract and the timing of it and all that, that that won't be an issue. So uh, I, I get the paranoia. And hey, <laughs> because of blemishes on the Cowboys track record over the years, 2019 summer, good example. Uh, I, I understand some of that, uh, no doubt, but no, that's that, that, those three deals all could very well still happen uh, despite a, a right tackle move. Love to hear it. Love to hear it. I'm sure that the chat does as well because, you know, we can have those mindsets as analysts and like fans watching from the inside, but to have an insider like Mr. Michael Gelkin say it is also amazing to hear. Now, I want to move on a little bit here and stay with the offense and stay with the offense for a moment. Because big story heading into week one of the 2023 NFL season. And we are finally here. It's days away. Sunday night kickoff versus the New York Giants. We are going to see a quote-unquote new offense. And it's called the Texas Coast. Or they're calling it the Texas Coast. It's not officially called that or anything like that. But, you know, we've heard a specific number all year long. And it's 30%. How much change are we going to see? And they tell us 30%. Or sometimes they tell us it's going to stay 70% the same, which is exactly the same thing. And it almost feels like it's an organizational number because you hear it from Mike McCarthy, you hear it from Dak Prescott, you hear it from everybody. Do you, from what you've seen in training camp and from what we've seen in the preseason, do you think it's going to feel like more than 30%? And this is where I'm coming from. They can say 30%. But, like, they can mean the playbook language. They can mean the concepts that are actually in the playbook. But how it's called and how early downs are managed and how they approach third and long and all of that could make it feel like a whole lot more than 30%. From what you've seen in training camp and in the preseason, 
would you think that it's going to feel like more than 30%? I think a lot of the changes will require a pretty astute eye. Um, I think the cadence is really different this year to help with those nice. pre-snap penalties. Like that's been really re reimagined. Um, so that's radical. Um, the pass protection, there's, there's some real, real differences there. Uh, you'll see under Mike Solari, the new offensive line coach, he's got his own technique that he likes his offensive linemen to have. Uh, namely, you're going to see them a little more assertive in their pass sets, making that initial contact a little bit earlier uh, than in the past. Um, and then, you know, there's like some real nuanced changes in like the way they block up outside zone is, is going to be different and like things like that. Um, but, you know, I, I think a lot of it's it's, it's going to be the same. Like I think a lot of people when they're watching, you know, TV in a, in a packed bar aren't going to notice the cadence. They're not going to notice the outside zone. Uh, they're not going to you know notice the pass sets. But all those things are a part of what, you know, excites the Cowboys. Uh, they think they can protect Dak Prescott better. They think that they can have, uh, you know, better timing off the snap. And they also, you know, believe that with some of the footwork, you know, the big part of, you know, West Coast, Texas Coast, whatever uh, style of offense, uh, you really are tying the the routes and, you know, all, all, everything's, you know, you know, connected to the, the quarterback's footwork. And ultimately, it's, it's going to come down to execution. And, and that's the thing is that, yeah, we can talk about the scheme, uh, the changes and all that, but – it's, it's about personnel. It's about, you know, uh, you know, I, I think the, I look at the wide receiver core and if Dak Prescott, as he should, uh, reduces the interceptions and just overall becomes more efficient, you know, some of that's going to have to be on Dak stepping up his game. But I think you look at the week one receiver core and compare it to where it was this time last year, where we're still waiting for Michael Gallup to get back from his ACL tear. And little did we know how, how little he'd be able to give. But that was the light at the end of the receiver tunnel because you had an undrafted rookie, Dennis Houston, who's no longer on the team. He's on the Giants practice squad. He wasn't uh, – he was you know, he was starting. Uh, C.D. Lamb going into year three, you know, okay. But um, other than that, uh, you know, it just it just wasn't – the it wasn't really an acceptable group of, of players with Jalen Tolbert's development as what it was. James Washington had a fractured foot the first day it passed in Oxnard. So uh, they've come a long way personnel-wise. So, you know, if there's a 70% jump or 30, whatever you think that number is, I think it's really what's, what's going to be most important is if, if, if it's improvement, I think personnel driven is, is, is going to be a big part of that. Uh, and then, you know, not to take away from the coaching staff, because I know Mike McCarthy and his, his guys have put in a, a tremendous amount of work to work on these finer details and have things looking the same and, and really just um, you know, make things this a more efficient offense it was actually a little bit denser the playbook this year compared to years past so um but they've coached it well they're, they're, they're preaching understanding of the why to every play every concept so we'll see on paper it all sounds great it all sounds like the, the cowboys yeah. should should make a, a huge jump on offense but we'll see it's gonna be jimmy's and joe's over x's and o's right like the coaches like to say so i think i, I agree with that you know brandon cooks being in there might still be the biggest move of the offseason even if it happened back in March and we kind of forget about it or feel like we've talked enough about it. It's going to come up a lot on September once football games are being played. And again, we're already here, so it's pretty exciting. One last question, Michael, before I let you go, and this is going to be more of a defensive question because it's one where we kind of worry a little bit about the linebacker depth. You know, you know, uh, the roster comes out and we see three linebackers in it and we know that Marquise Bell is going to get some, uh, work at linebacker in uh, he said that Dan Quinn is is handing him those duties and we know what he can do and we know that the Cowboys are going to be playing a lot of dime personnel with those three safety looks we know that they want that speed but do you think that the Cowboys are all in on what they've got right now or is it or is there a outside addition still on the table somewhere in there potentially because we know that there are still some free agent linebackers that are maybe bigger names and they are potential contributors, but could they still seek outside help at the linebacker position? Or do you think they are all in, in that safety plan where they can get Marquise Bell to help out at linebacker and just move on with what they've got? I think it's the answer is a bit of both where they, they believe in what they have. Um, you mentioned it's, it's, it's definitely a different looking linebacker group. I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. It's, it's, it should be brought up. You know, they consider Micah Parsons more of a defensive end than a linebacker when they construct their 53-man roster. 
So you got Leighton Vanderish, you got Damone Clark, you've got Devin Harper, and then you have safety convert uh, linebacker Marquise Bell. And you know he's, we we have seen now in year three Dan Quinn this defense becoming increasingly positionless. You know we have Le- Leighton Vanderesh working more as an edge defender than we've seen now. I've seen I've seen Dorrance Armstrong drop back in coverage more than I'd seen him. Um, they're just doing all these different things to throw all kinds of looks at opposing offenses and there's a lot of excitement in the building about this defense about the leap that they think they're going to make which is saying something for a unit that was as good at pressuring the quarterback as any defense in the nfl and also led the league in takeaways for a second straight season they they really believe in what they have at the same time with all positions you need to have a, a list of guys on the street who are your priority so i wouldn't be surprised to see the cowboys maybe bring in somebody uh, maybe after the after week one, maybe on the practice squad, something like that. I'm I'm kind of spitballing. I, I I haven't had any direct conversations with anyone about it, so we'll see. But you just look at the the makeup of it. Um, it's worth noting that Luke Jefferson is on the practice squad, and so that gives them some you know so, sort of depth at that position. But the one area where I think this whole thing kind of has relevance uh, beyond defense is on special teams because typically on special teams for Mike McCarthy, he likes having like guys who are like, you know, 250 pounds, you know, that kind of that, that that size element to them. This is as small of a special teams unit as I've ever seen following the NFL, covering the NFL. Like this is a really, you know, smaller group. We've got a team with four running backs, three tight ends, you know, the four linebackers, which includes a safety, um, you know, effectively, and then a whole bunch of safeties, um, you know, and corners of grinding it out. So uh, I'm really interested to see how John Fossil gets imaginative to be effective and, and, and what sort of things are thrown out uh, schematically, uh, special teams wise, and what sort of things are inserted because of the speed. So um, that to me is, is one of the interesting, you know, storylines that Probably won't be written a whole lot because it's, a, it's kind of boring to a lot of people. Yeah. But to me, I think it's it's just interesting because it's different. Uh, it's it's definitely a, a stress point on this 53-man roster that could be a weakness that will get exposed or it could somehow manage to be a strength if, if the Cowboys can design it and find it in, in a, an execution standpoint to be the right, to be so. So we'll see how it all pans out. Yeah, I, I've, I've felt all off season long that we have barely talked about losing Luke Gifford, who who was a big, big part of that special teams unit. It looked like it was going to be overshown, got injured. So now I agree with you. It's like, who, who's going to stand up and how is it going to actually uh, look like? And I'll just say, yeah. there's there's a deeper conversation that we could have down the road about what if teams come out there and just 21 personnel you, 12 per- personnel you, all game long, right? With a smaller looking defense in that sense. But anyways, Michael, thank you so much for joining the show. I really appreciate your time. Uh, You have been killing it since you got to Dallas and you are really somebody that the fan base looks up to. Uh, Thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you, Mauricio. Have a good one. And and where in Mexico are you? I didn't realize. I'm in Chihuahua, Mexico. So it's like a three hour drive away from El Paso, Texas. Yeah, yeah. I'm familiar with it. uh, That's awesome. That's awesome. Yes, sir. All right. Have a good one. Appreciate you. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Michael. See you. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen, Michael Gelkin joining the show. Uh, I was excited about that interview. I'm not going to lie to you. I really do admire uh, the work that Michael Gelkin has done since he got to Dallas. And that's why I wanted to sneak in that Patrick Mahomes comment. I really was impressed with the way that Gelkin was dominating the roster cut down day, and and you got to give him some credit. But anyways, what's up, ladies and gentlemen? Let me talk to you guys in the chat. It was a fantastic guest that we had on tonight, so I I try to play it cool with the chat. I was, you know, making the most out of the time that we had with Mike. Uh, Guru says, thanks, Mike, for the guest appearance. It was awesome, man. Donald Lee says, Michael Gelkin is the man. I agree, man. We had a lot of good tidbits from that interview, I think. We got the radical changes on the cadence. And I agree, like, sometimes you don't even get to hear it right from the broadcast. And the cadence of a quarterback and of an offense is so such a complex topic that even without the coaching context, it doesn't matter how, not, how much you know about quarterback play and all of that. You don't know cadences 
and what the team is trying to do, it's very difficult to figure it out. So I, I thought that it was pretty interesting what he said about the cadence being a radical, because that's the word that he used, uh, radical change to the Cowboys offense. I'm really looking forward to seeing what all of that means. Pass protection, we've heard about, right, in the in the press conferences and everything, but cadence, I, I know that Dak Prescott told Nick Idman something about it on his show, but didn't go into details at all. Uh, Philip Gonzalez says he knows his stuff. He really does, man. And one of the things that I have learned about Michael and, and you know, yeah, I'm giving him his flowers. He really does deserve them. One of the things that I have learned from him is you've got X's and O's guys and you've got beat reporters and beat writers. Uh, Michael is so versatile, though. Michael is so versatile because he will come up to the press conferences and make detailed X's and O's questions to the coaches. And, and sometimes Mike McCarthy has even laughed about it in, in pressers. So the versatility of him and, and all of what he does is really something that you got to look up to for sure. Uh, Toxic Tom says, Mo, I heard him basically say the tempo is faster, which would be pretty impressive. Uh, maybe not the speed of it. Uh, I mean, the speed of it is going to be what would be very impressive, but the Cowboys were pretty high on tempo with Kellen Moore. So I don't think it's going to be about seeing more tempo. It might be like Toxic said, it's going to be about faster tempo. And also very intrigued about what that could mean. Uh, there was also that conversation that I would have loved to continue for like an hour and a half more just the size of this defense is something to think about. Um, and we've, ta we've talked about the lack of a number three linebacker for a while now. Uh, and since Overshone's injury, obviously things got worse. And we know about Marquise Bell dropping down. But that thought popped into my mind as he talked about the size of the defense. It might not be very fun to play against the 49ers if they want to go on those heavy packages and really force you to be heavy and force you out of those dying personnel groupings. Like, what is the plan going to be there uh, if that happens? It might be also a good reason why the Cowboys stuck with Neville Gallimore. You need that big buddy at three technique because he's more of a three tech, in my opinion, than a nose tackle, which is different from Quinton where you go, okay, he's big, but I, I've already got no stackles. Really just got my head spinning a little bit there with all of that. Uh, pretty fun conversation. I gotta, I, I want to get to a lot of your comments right here. Uh, Marcus Rose, I actually don't worry so much about the offensive line after the preseason. I think that the offensive line coach can make up anything lacking. Just got, just got a good feeling, says Marcus. The thing about the offensive line for me is that we're worrying about depth, which is a very, very extremely fair worry because it can make or break seasons as we have learned as Cowboys fans. But you also look at the NFL with an objective and cold point of view. And other than maybe like the Cleveland Browns, and I'm not even sure about the depth that the Eagles have, but obviously they've got the best offensive line in the NFL starters wise. Like, depth is a problem for pretty much every team in the NFL. The, the one exception that I can think about is the Cleveland Browns, who are insanely deep at, at offensive line, and it's one of the best units in the NFL, in my opinion. Uh, thank you to Donald for tuning into the show. Thank you for your comment, sir. Uh, Danny says, what have we done in 30 years? Uh, some, some complaints there about the Cowboys' history, which I totally understand. Danny Savage also says, Michael Gallup, me, ears, Tolbert. Man, watching Jalen Tolbert push for the third spot would be pretty fun to see. I uh, hope that we see that because it would be in a positive way, I believe. Katharina says, heck yes, I cannot wait to start the season off already. Here we go. Dakins isn't going uh, nowhere, says Mr. Cowboys Nation. Parsons is fixing to be the highest paid defensive end and City will get paid as well. And, and this was a question that I wanted to ask Michael Gelkin because, you know, about the possibility of the Cowboys later on playing hardball with one of those three stars where you're talking about Dak, Trevor, not Dak, CD, and Micah in 2024. Because I agree with what Cowboys Stats tweeted out. I think it was Cowboys Stats. And let me try to find the tweet 
so I can read it to you word by word. But Cowboys Stats tweeted out earlier today, if the Cowboys have a sound and flexible plan for keeping Dak, CD, and Parsons here long-term, then deals like Steel's extension don't bug me much. But they will sometimes do stuff like this and then turn around and penny pinch in players like Amari, which I found confusing. So I'm with Michael Gelkin in that the Cowboys, like this is in a, this, uh, today's contract isn't one that would bring all of those plans down. The Cowboys front office like make you wonder, right? They, they, they make you wonder if they are going to play hardball when the time comes with players that you don't want them to play hardball with because we don't want them to see, but we don't want to see them do that with Dak and with CD and with Micah when they're going to be the cornerstones of your franchise for years to come, right? So uh, pretty tough to, to really uh, figure that one out. Danny says, who is in, who in this room likes Dan Quinn's defense, two linebackers and six defensive backs on the field. No wonder 22 versus run, says Danny Savage. Um, I like Dan Quinn's defense. I do. I do. I do wonder, though, about that size conversation that we were uh, having right at the end of the, of the interview. It's going to be something to watch for sure. Um Shout out to Mrs. Charles, who's on the show. You see that? Nailed it. Some of you will understand that reference um, if, you, if you watch the show every night. Guru says, Kellen had up tempo and multi pre-snap motion, but thought he actually slowed the tempo to lessen the confusion for Dak during his struggles. Oh, uh, hmm. That is interesting for sure. I don't know what the correct answer is for that. But I'll say this, and I'll, I have said it for a long, long time. Mental processing is not one that I would doubt Dak Prescott for. So I'm not sure if he would want them to slow down the tempo. But I do know that Dak pre-snap is one of the best that there is in the entire NFL. That's where Dak, that's one area where Dak can really enter that top five conversation in mental processing pre-snap. Ten Green Rangers says, time to get some 250, 260 linebackers. The 2020 lot pound guys get hurt too much. And what is true is that Kears is pretty big. Like, even for a... Listen, Kears is pretty big, and I will say this. Marquise Bell, it's going to be tough to find this in my notebook right now. But Marquise Bell does have some good percentiles when it comes to size. And I'm trying to find him. So, yeah, I think I have them here. He's 70 uh, in terms of weight, he's in the 73rd percentile among NFL safeties. So, that means he is heavier than 73% of the safeties in the league. So, he's a big safety, uh, which is pretty crazy because I don't like you, you, you mentioned Marquise Bell's names to me, and I'm not going to think of him as a big guy. I don't know. Maybe I'm just. Maybe I just have the wrong picture of him in my mind, but that is big. That is big. 73rd percentile of safeties in the NFL, that is definitely big. Uh, obviously, that number would change when you compare them to, to, to linebackers, but it's still something to note. And 91 percentile in terms of his speed, so you know he can make up for that. He can make up for that in speed. Anyways, ladies and gentlemen, that will be it for me tonight here on the show. Great interview with Michael Gelkin. Uh, shout out to him for bringing the fire on tonight's show. It came about pretty late, not going to lie, yesterday. So it was pretty cool to have this work out with schedules and everything. Because imagine how busy he is with week one upon us. Because ladies and gentlemen, week one is upon us. You know what we'll talk about? Tomorrow and on Tuesday and on Wednesday and on Thursday, we're going to talk about the regular season. We're going to talk about matchups. We are going to get into some bold predictions. We are going to get into actual football. Not preseason, not training camp, not anything like that. And it will be fun. It will be pretty fun. Ladies and gentlemen, have a fantastic long weekend. And I will see you here at prime time 8 p.m central every sunday through thursday night ladies and gentlemen do me a favor smash the like button though 
thumbs up if you enjoy the show because that helps me put A to Z Sports Dallas Primetime in front of more and more Cowboys fans. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of LSU Florida State if you are. Bye-bye.